hello everybody welcome <laughs> welcome back so uh what you just saw was this little little toy which is the quality of the day which to me actually symbolizes uh represents uh feedback because as you saw you know like uh <laughs> spinning really fast and it actually becomes kind of stationary and if you move it around it takes a while for kind of like the movement to propagate through the entire system, even though the string, you know, the string is moving faster than the waves in the string, which makes it a really fun, really fun gadget, really fun to play with. Um, there's much better videos out there showing the tricks you can do with it. Uh, apparently cats really, <laughs> really have a blast with it. Uh, but the reason, you know, that is the quality of the day is that it's a kind of like really excellent visual kinesthetic metaphor for a lot of the phenomenology actually of kind of like doing jana jana practice and today <laughs> today we're gonna talk about my second jana retreat uh you know insights uh openings um takeaways learnings suggestions and recommendations for anybody out there who is interested in pursuing these um you know for the record i'm not like an expert on this by any means um I, I i i do think a lot a lot a lot about consciousness and the nature of reality and physics and philosophy um i also meditate but uh i'm not you know an adept meditator or something like that this is actually only my third retreat um i've kind of like taken meditation more seriously for yeah, the last three years or something like that um, and I'll tell you a little bit about kind of my my daily practice and 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 what do, why do I do it why do I enjoy it and why that what I'm trying to get out of it. Um, but yeah, so just very very brief kind of a recap. Um, I made a video called Buddhist Annealing, which was kind of a insights from the first uh, two week meditation retreat that I did, and it was following essentially Shenzhen Yang's advice, cultivating equanimity and the seven factors of awakening there's also a quality computing article about it <clears throat> that was in 2021 uh was very healing but it was definitely not you know janic in 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 any explicit way or any emergent way you know equanimity as we will see <laughs> has many flavors and i think the flavor of equanimity i was cultivating there uh was not a janic equanimity um then last year in november so relatively recently um i did a two-week meditation retreat at home following Rob Urbia's Practicing the Jana's lecture series. Uh, you know, that actually took over, took place over the course of three weeks. So I, I compressed the lectures a little bit. So uh, I ended up, I guess, like listening to them at a higher rate than the people who actually did that retreat. It's, it's fine. I mean, uh, either way, um, uh, I think I was very motivated and very disciplined for that retreat. I meditated, you know, I counted these with a, with a timer every day. I meditated um, on average eight hours a day, sometimes a little bit more, sometimes a little bit less. Um, this time it was only a one week retreat, technically nine days, but in practice seven, because actually this, what I'm doing right now is the very end of, you know, those nine days. And also on the first day, I still had <laughs> still, still had a couple tasks to do. So in practice, it was like seven days of completely focused on doing the Jana retreat. Um, you know, a little bit on the other days as well, but not, you know, not as much. And uh, uh, I took it much more lightly. Uh, actually, I think like that's kind of like what felt right. What I sensed would actually give me... Uh, the most openings, uh, Robert Via talks about, like in a Jenna retreat, you need to let the day breathe as it were. So, you know, kind of, kind of like counting the hours. Uh, I estimate on this retreat, um, on the typical day, I meditated between four and six hours. So in some sense, uh, this is almost kind of like 25% as much meditation as the previous retreat or, you know, a quarter of the dose <laughs> of, of Jana meditation. So nothing extreme, you know, this is not hardcore Danny Lingram style of like, you know, three weeks for 16 hours a day or something like that. Now, this was much more light. Still, though, I continue to be impressed with uh, <clears throat> the difference that it really makes um, actually, you know, doing this rigorously as opposed to 
just once in a while meditating or, or even like something like a practice of 20 minutes a day can be very helpful and healing, but it's just not the same dose. I mean, it's kind of the difference between a micro dose of LSD or something and then like 200 micrograms is a <laughs> very different territory. Um, and there's probably some transformations that can only happen at those levels, uh, having to do with energy and entropy and impedance matching <laughs> and other properties uh, we will briefly go over. <laughs> um, so I would say, yeah, the first retreat uh, was the first time I would say I, I experienced the first jhana and it was a powerful opening experience. I think it was really intense and like it didn't last very long, but when I, it was very strong absorption, kind of like very immersive and uh, not, not only like whole body, but it actually was like the whole what's called energy body, like the whole kind of like cocoon, very intense first jhana. I was impressed and I, you know, I had heard that jhanas can be really intense, um, but uh, you have to kind of experience it to believe that, in fact, uh, a first jhana can be as intense as something like waiting room level DMT experience. And I assume probably even breakthrough level DMT experience if, if you're like much more advanced. Um, uh so meaning these these are like seriously you know intense altered states of consciousness but unlike dmt they are uh by their very nature by the very nature of what you're cultivating actually extremely high valence and very pure in their valence uh as, as we will see though uh, as you go through the jhanas they become more pure in their valence uh but even the first jhana, jhana is like so much more pure than you know, typical kind of like body pleasure that we are used to in everyday life or even with other substances. That said, you know, <laughs> I have never, you know, IV'd heroin or methamphetamine. So I don't know if that feels equivalent to the first jhana. Um, I suspect it might be kind of in the same ballpark. Uh, I would love to talk to people who have tried both. I uh, I would not recommend trying <laughs> doing that just to get the comparison because it might ruin your life. Uh, but um, that would be an interesting thing to know. Um, but, you know, comparing it to something like, oh, the high of kind of like alcohol or THC or, you know, kind of like weak euphorians or, or, or you know, uh, not not comparable. Like the, the first Jana is... <laughs> a lot better, a lot better than those. <laughs> that said, uh, as I've explained, it is, I think, very common for people to meditate, uh, then experience some PT, which is like this very pleasant body sensation, which is like an ingredient to get to the first jhana. And then uh, kind of assume that that was it, that that was the first jhana. And, and sometimes it's going to be like, oh, yeah, you experienced tons of pleasure in meditation. But then I realized, you know, it wasn't that big of a deal. Um, no, I mean, like if, if you're experiencing the first jhana and you're not saying, wow, if, if, if your, if your jaw is not dropping when it's actually happening, um, either you weren't experiencing it or maybe there's something wrong with you. <laughs> maybe there's some, I think it's kind of unlikely. I mean, I think like it's part, kind of like part of the state that when it happens for the first couple of times, it just, it blows you away. Um, and yeah, on the first retreat, I had that. I also had a, an important opening for the second and third jhana, but that was about it. Um, this retreat, uh, the difference was, I, I, PD, you know, the body pleasure was actually much more accessible, much more reliable. <clears throat> it took me less time to get there. Um, I only experienced the first jhana clearly once, and it was nowhere near as intense as the first retreat. Again, maybe dose dependent. Um, because by the time I actually experienced the, the strong Jan, I was like on the eighth day, right. Of the two week retreat. So already kind of like double the amount of meditation than what I did these, uh, these retreats. So that may, that may be part of it. Um, but also something that Rob Borbia says, uh, is that as you experience higher and more refined Janas, actually the quality of the lower Janas changes. And I think that has to do with some kind of like full spectrum harmonization process, where as you harmonize in the higher frequencies and the more refined velvety qualities of consciousness, 
<clears throat> that kind of reharmonizes the lower Janus. In particular, the first one um, becomes kind of more subtle, perhaps higher valence, but less dramatic and less... Um, um, you know, Nick Camerata actually describes it as like the first times he used to experience the jhana, the first jhana, it was kind of like super cyan in that. And, you know, from a signal processing perspective, you know, like triangular waves, like I think like that, that used to happen. And also, yeah, when I was getting the first intimations of the first jhana, in the first, in the first jhana retreat, for sure, I was experiencing a lot of like, kind of like buzzing that was, uh, it had kind of like a kiki component. It had like a slightly spiky component. And I think that that is involved in some kind of process of purification and annealing that was absent or largely absent in this jhana. I think like by now that has quieted down quite a bit. So the first jhana felt so much more smooth than the previous, uh, the previous retreat. Um, but there's also another another difference, which is my uh, consumption of caffeine. Um, I noticed on the previous retreat that, you know, I'm I'm a I'm a coffee lover. Uh, I think like on average, on average, I, I drink about three or four cups of coffee a day. Uh, I've concluded over the years that fits well with my lifestyle, my psychology, and my um, system. Uh, in the first Jana retreat, however, I noticed that coffee was synergistic with PD, but the more kind of gross, um, gross kind of a um, triangular wave type of PD. Um, and there were a couple days where I actually only had like one or two cups of coffee. And on those days, I actually had like a much more serene type of Jana. And so this retreat, I actually explored like significantly lowering my caffeine consumption um, to the point that for the last three days, I didn't have any caffeine. Um, and uh, so that's also an important factor to, to consider. Uh, and I do think actually that was very helpful for kind of a opening deeper or like higher jhanas because maybe caffeine is actually pretty good to cultivate to start, you know, to call, you know, you have energy, motivation, and you can um, really kind of like season that 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 pity and and make it strong and 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 juice it up but it comes at the cost of um you you don't subtle subtleize it as much it doesn't become as subtle and so i think like the higher genus uh become a little bit blocked so i actually did find that on the whole having less caffeine or a lot less caffeine these retreat um was pretty beneficial. And so the openings I experienced were much more up across the spectrum. And also, rather than hearing all of all of the, the lectures by Raburbia, I only listened to the ones about Janus and how to cultivate PD. Like, yeah, much more kind of just the pure instructions, less the full Q&As and clarifications and, and all of that. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, really, I mean, you know, just kind of like... <laughs> Going to the to the bottom of it very quickly, and and then I'll elaborate. I think like the biggest openings, these retreat for me actually were, of the realm of nothingness, uh, the seventh jhana. Uh, interestingly, uh, interestingly that that opened up. You know, I'm sure not in a, in a full kind of like realm way, but like in a very tangible and way that ob you know had obvious effects on my energy body and actually was synergistic. Interestingly, with both. PD and Sukha, you know, well-being in the body and happiness. Um, even though for a lot of people, the concept of nothingness might be quite, you know, depressing or nihilistic. That's just not at all how I see it. And, uh, <laughs> and I'll explain why. <laughs> and it has to do with zero ontology. But that's a <laughs> later item in uh, in this discussion. But yeah, I mean, essentially, that's kind of the bottom line. I, I experienced a much deeper appreciation for, for nothingness, uh, the state of nothingness the feeling of nothingness and, and its qualia and its uh, hedonic effects and its synergistic effects uh, with other states of consciousness. And that was fantastic. So, so highly recommend it. Okay. So what I'm going to do is actually give you, you know, a little bit of kind of, a, you know, like core ideas of how Rob Rubia teaches the Janus so that even if you don't listen to, to him, you have like something to, to go off of. I would still recommend highly <laughs> that at some point you do something like 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 this, you know, spend a couple of weeks just listening to those lectures and practicing. And it's going to be such a 
it is life changing. It's profound. I, I I really recommend it if if you can afford it, if you have the time and the uh, the 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 possibility and the motivation. Um, but you know, even you know, through the lens of Andres or through the lens of QRI, uh, <laughs> it, it it makes sense to kind of like go through some of these. So I, I made a video right before the retreat actually about meta loving kindness. I talked about sensitivity, responsivity, and attunement. You know, very quickly. One of the things that Robert Bia really encourages is to really increase the sensitivity in your energy body. Uh, this is a phenomenological construct or phenomenological reality. You know, it's kind of like the concept of attention. Like we don't need to make strong claims about its ontological status in order to utilize it, right? We can utilize the concept of attention. We, likewise, we can utilize the concept of energy body. And so... Um, <clears throat> the idea of a lot of these practices is to actually breathe into the energy body. Um, you breathe in and out and, and, you know, for example, when you breathe in, you imagine that you're energizing it. And, and the energy body is not just your felt sense of the body. It's kind of like this cocoon around you is, you know, and when you get really absorbed into it, actually the, the physical body boundaries dissolve um, or do, they're just not there. They may not even dissolve. Like the, the feeling of dissolution may not arise, but you may just like skip them <laughs> and you're all of a sudden in this like spacious awareness state um, with a lot of um, a lot of sensibility. So use that as kind of um, the thermometer for what is going on, right? Like so you, you say a, a loving kindness phrase, for example, and then you notice how that affects the energy body or you do an attentional movement and you notice how that affects it. So Training that feedback system essentially sensible, sensitizes you to have kind of a large surface area to play with of your phenomenological space. The second one is responsivity. I think this was like very, very powerful to learn uh, because it is not how meditation is taught in general. In general, meditation tends to be taught in a very formulaic way. It's like, oh, these, do these, 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 and these will arise. Do these, 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 and these will arise. But then in practice, you know, you're doing these, maybe the first step works. The second step uh, doesn't really work. And then like the teacher just tells you, well, you, you know, keep practicing, keep doing it. Eventually it's going to open up. Robert Bia has a very, you know, he defers. He has a very different approach here. He essentially suggests if something is not working, try something else. I mean, like, really think of it as kind of like you're fine-tuning uh, a very complex system and, and uh, you know, you're shaking it this way. Well, nothing happens. Well, what about if you shake it this way? How about this way? Mm, if you turn it around? Uh, <laughs> so, you know, and at the macro level, this may even be something like, all right, I've been practicing for an hour and, like, I actually don't feel very good. The hindrances are attacking me. Maybe I should go for a walk. You know, that's one possible response at the micro level is much more subtle <clears throat> it's kind of like what micro adjustments in posture or in the quality of attention or in the way i'm spreading awareness will make my experience feel better in the moment and well that's the direction for the jhanas and Essentially, you need a lot of creativity here, and, and there's a lot of things that you can do. You know, like uh, when you're trying to, to get the, the PD to, to spread, you can, for example, imagine that there is some kind of like tube that connects the different components of your body so that the PD can move around freely. That's one example. <laughs> you know, you can shake the PD a little bit, or you can kind of like softly, you know, add a wave of attention around it, or... Or, you know, there's a whole way of, you know, whole set of kind of like attentional techniques. You can imagine that attention is a receiver as opposed to kind of an emitter. I mean, like the typical way we think of attention is kind of like you're emitting, emitting waves and you're seeing what comes back. But, but there's kind of this very active component of like sending, sending energy and, and kind of like scanning. A different mode of attention is completely receptive. You're, you're just there trying to receive. And then you can play with a bunch of, you know, it's a, it's a combinatorial explosion because then you can also play with uh, focusing on, let's say, the, your stomach and then receiving sensations in your stomach. Or you may, for example, receive sensations in your stomach at the same time as you emitting sensations from your nose, right? Like, again, I'm just giving you some random possibilities. In reality, there's an enormous set of possibilities. And so 
another example is like if you have a uh, discomfort in your body one of the things that robert bia suggests is like well why don't you imagine that there is meta being emitted from it right it's not a natural type of movement that you might make you know usually you might want to send love to that part imagine that that part that is hurt actually is sending love it's a different thing it may not work but it may work and so the answer is to try it just to try it all and uh, kind of like develop this intuition for what works in what context, in what state, and then just, you know, do it and, and, and let it unfold. Then the third big suggestion is attunement. Attunement, which is you've got to develop the sensitivity to different frequencies. And here is where it sounds very woo, but no, again, this is a phenomenological reality where Different sensations have different frequencies. This is also something that we take very seriously at QRI. Stephen Lehar in Harmonic Gestalt, which we, you can see online and YouTube as well. Yeah, I mean, essentially larger phenomenological constructs vibrate at a lower frequency and smaller phenomenological constructs vibrate at a higher frequency. Um, the DMT space is higher frequency than the LSD space. Like uh, body, you know, PT is lower frequency than Sukha, uh, happiness. All of that is absolutely true. And, and, and you can verify it for yourself as you develop kind of this like sensitivity for tuning. And, and the thing too is that even when you're tuning into a particular part of your body, actually you're sensitizing yourself to find what frequency to tune into. And, and there's also a duality between, you know, vibratory, you know, spectrum and shape. And so in some sense, like tuning into a shape is the same as tuning into a set of frequencies. All of that is super helpful. I mean, actually, I think, you know, a master, master, you know, signal processing engineer with experience with uh, 3D audio, <laughs> lots of experience with 3D audio. And I'm, I'm, I mean, like, a, not a fake one, you know, not somebody who just studied electrical engineers, <laughs> oh, no. who just studied, you know, I mean, somebody who actually plays with the thing on a daily basis, develops an intuition, I bet, um, they will have a leg up, you know, for kind of like learning tricks for how to tune into different components of their experience and give rise to jhanas. <laughs> so that's something to, to consider. Yeah, the attunement thing is something that is a whole topic, could be a very long video on its own. I just mention it because it's a, a, a key, key, key ingredient here. Then uh, Robert Bia also talks about this acronym called SASI, S-A-S-S-I-E which is short for spread. <laughs> you want to spread the PT or you want to spread the happiness or the peacefulness, depending on what jhana you're talking about. Um, but once, once you're fully spread, then you're done. So that one has like an end, you know, okay, it's fully spread, period. Then there's absorption, which uh, there's no end to it. It's really just a vector. It's like how absorbed you can be. And even very advanced meditators will tell you yeah, there's no end to it. I mean, I suppose there's probably an end to it and maybe, you know, cessation or the unfabricated state, <laughs> the ninth jhana, maybe that is full abs absorption. I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe, probably. But but essentially absorption is, is a vector. And like in general, in pretty much all states, you can be more absorbed. So you can be more, you know, embody the PT more and become it more and more. And for example, the opening I had in the first retreat that I was telling you, I think was like really playing with the absorption metric where the really powerful like opening of, of the first jhana was like when I was able to really absorb into the PT. And and it, it was not, <laughs> it's, it's a non, not, a, not an ordinary thing. That's a very strange thing that happens when, when, when you can do it. Um, then... SS is for suffused and sustained. You can also sustain it for longer. So absorption would be kind of like this instantaneous, you know, how much is it actually, how much are you into it versus sustained is for how long. So also you can play with that. That's also a vector. Then intensity. Uh, he actually doesn't emphasize intensity. He doesn't think it's that important. I suspect intensity is quite important from the point of view of energy and annealing. So probably ratcheting up intensity for some purposes is very significant, but, <clears throat> but, um, you know, he doesn't take it very, he doesn't consider it as like that important, but you know, it's part of the acronym and E is for enjoy, enjoy. And this is the idea that like you, what you're trying to do essentially, it's ultimately a very mundane thing, which is like, how do you, 
find a way of seeing and interacting with your phenomenal world that will maximize enjoyment. You know, very hedonistic. Now, I've got to say this is not hedonistic in the, you know, typical traditional way of, you know, selfish pleasure seeking, because actually this takes a lot of work and play and is demanding. You know, it's it's not <laughs> it's not a it's not the same as just going into a spa or something. I mean, meditate, you know, it, it's exhausting. It takes effort and so on. So um, and on top of that, the states that you're cultivating tend to be very selfless. You know, if you're using loving kindness, you're really trying to get rid of things such as greed and um, and hatred and delusion and other, other qualities of experience that typically emerge when somebody is just a pleasure-seeking junkie, you know, a meth addict. This is a completely different dimension in some ways opposite, in some ways opposite dimension. Um, but this idea that to remind yourself that the purpose, what you're doing on a moment to moment basis is mm, tuning into enjoyment. And, and I think that is powerful. Most people, I think, actually have some hangups around it. Uh, either they feel judged or they feel that others will judge them or, or, or um, they have like even just like blockages, you know, like, like uh, traumatic memories or, or unpleasant sensations. Whenever joy comes up, they, they may fear uh, it's just going to go away anyway. So why care about it? Um, or if you ask somebody in the street, you know, like, oh, when, when you've felt very joyful, like, what did that actually feel like? Could you concentrate on it? <laughs> Most people will have no idea what you're talking about, right? So it's a very subtle thing, but it's a very real and powerful thing. And I think telling yourself that you're there for enjoyment and, and really, you know, a deep, deep sense of fulfillment um, gives you, causes a psychological, positive psychological change moment after moment, the more you do it, moment after moment, you learn to love yourself and um, and accept yourself and and accept that, yeah, you are worthy of enjoyment just as everybody else. And that's wonderful and beautiful. So, yeah, that's part of the ingredients. Um, I'll also mention, uh, yeah, kind of like a little bit more about yeah, modes of attention, which is that um, as you progress into more reified states of consciousness, yeah, the range of modes of attention uh, really expand. And so, you know, we tend to kind of like have like a very narrow mode of attention. I suspect actually there's like subconscious processes that are like narrowing it down. It's not that it out, you know, on its own automatically for the law because of the laws of physics or something, it has to do that. Um, but, you know, one of the important practices is that you open up, you open up your awareness constantly and it will close constantly, but you open it up again and again and again <laughs> to the whole body, to the whole energy body space. And so that it's a kind of unusual mode of attention and uh, apparently it takes a long while for it to actually stick, you know, and there's people who've done insight and, and Jana practice for years and actually that's how they experience the world all the time. You know, they're always spreading fully their attention throughout their body and they have kind of this beautiful ease in the body and, and sense of embodiment and they're very in touch with their emotions and open-hearted and that's one of the effects that, that this has. But uh, probably because some, some subconscious processes and habitual patterns, that's not automatic at all. Um, yeah, the last thing I'll say in this category is I also mixed in uh, Wim Hof uh, breathing exercises. I find them very helpful and mildly psychedelic. Not, I mean, Wim Hof doesn't take you to the waiting room levels of, of DMT or anything like that, but it might take you to something similar to a threshold level DMT experience, um, which you can then use as a source of PT. Um, essentially you see it or you, th you perceive, decide to experience it as a very positive energy source. And so, yeah, when you're like re retaining or, um, or breathing again, and you're getting all these vibrations in the body, turn them in a janic way towards pleasure, well-being, sense of wholesome harmony. And that really helps. That really helps. I did not have that as a tool on the first, 
the first retreat, and I think uh, it would have been helpful, to be honest. Uh, I don't know why Robert Bia doesn't talk about breathing exercises. Maybe they're bad for you. <laughs> I honestly don't know, you know, like maybe, maybe they kill brain cells. Um, I suspect it actually just makes you more resilient. And there's like, yeah, some studies that show that people essentially who do a lot of Wim Hof uh, are better able to handle stress, not only of the psychological kind, but also better able to resist diseases uh, like E. coli and things like that. I don't know how legitimate that research is, but um, the point is it's probably it's probably not going to kill you um, and it probably might reduce your stress a little bit. But for the purpose of jhana practice, the main benefit is it's a way to play with the energy parameter, um, kind of like moving along these like psychedelic axes without taking any substance. And I found them very helpful. I was going to say that my daily typical meditation practice is actually like 10 minutes of Wim Hof breathing exercises followed by 10 minutes of metta, followed by 10 minutes of compassion uh, practice, uh, often guided with music. And I'll show you some link or like I'll make a playlist for like what kind of music or what kind of meditation to do that. But, you know, that's like a solid like half an hour or like very engaged, very energized and very pleasant meditation. And every day, yeah, it, it actually does, does something. Uh, again, a retreat is a much much higher dose and it takes you to completely completely different places real territory as uh, as daniel ingram might might say um okay now i'm gonna move on to say that the you know kind of like the relationship with desire of like what is it that you know i was trying to achieve here and you know it's ongoing but uh it's something that i kind of annealed on the first jana retreat which was this concept of quilia mastery because there is this, you know, this tendency, this culture, you know, if you see Avatar, uh, <laughs> not the James Cameron movie, uh, but the the cartoon, uh, you know, there's kind of culturally we have this relationship with, you know, powers and meditations and so on as kind of like it's something that makes you really special, something that, you know, it's a decorator of the self, you know, it's kind of like you're getting an award or something. Um, and that mentality is very counterproductive for developing the janus interestingly you know that's something wonderful about the janus is that if somebody's actually accessing real territory there chances are they they've had unless they're sociopathic i mean i don't know there's probably some exceptions but in general i think they probably have had to uh develop a relationship with their self image and desire that is more healthy and less kind of like self-obsessed, I think, in general. So um, that was something that kind of like really came to the front. Is like, hey, I do have a competitive mindset for a lot of things. I want to be the first one to solve a particular problem or something like that. So like, yeah, of course, yes, I've got to develop the Janus or something like that. But, you know, sure, like there's some subconscious processes like that got really attenuated on the first retreat and instead the thing that i annealed to which feels so much better so much more wholesome and sustainable is what i called quilia mastery and quilia mastery has these three elements which are a it's for the sake of all beings you know you're developing this quilia mastery so that you can actually help everybody uh, and i think understanding consciousness is going to be enormously relevant for the future <laughs> for the present especially for the future where it's going to get really weird. Um, second is to experience the mystery of consciousness directly, you know, be a participant in this wonderful play of form. It's, um, <clears throat> it's not to be satisfied with knowing things intellectually, but also having a firsthand experience of them. You know, Mary's room, you want to see the red. You don't want to learn about red in a neuroscience book. The same with, with the Janus or, ide you know, ideally exotic, arbitrary exotic states of consciousness. And then the third one, though, and here is where it's actually quite different than, you know, something like Zen practice or something. Qualia mastery also holds as one of its three pillars the love of knowledge, you know, actually understanding this. And I'll get to some of those insights towards the end, you know, in the first video about the first retreat, I talked about the brain as a nonlinear optical computer. And that is my current kind of like best model, you know, what QRI has <laughs> been leading towards, 
uh, all of its paradigms kind of like start to fit together within that view. And uh, a lot of the things I experience make a lot more sense when you think of it in that sense, as opposed to just the brain as a neural network or the brain as a predictive processing system or something, something more narrow like that uh, without implementation details. Anyway, we want to know the truth. We want to know how consciousness is related to physics and mathematics and chemistry and algorithms. And we want to know it all, right? Like that is part of the drive. But that would be a very unhealthy drive if it wasn't kind of balanced by A, loving kindness, really wanting to help all sentient beings, and B, actually having, you know, um, skin in the game, like actually wanting to be a participant in it, right? Otherwise, you, you don't really, you don't, you're not really studying or understanding it deeply. Um, so anyway, so that is Quillian Mastery. That is kind of like a lot of the impetus, the, the desire that is keeping me <laughs> wanting to continue to explore these spaces. And, uh, you know, you, I, of course, I, I recommend you engage with Quilia Mastery, but y you don't have to. I mean, ultimately, you'll come up with um, something that really resonates with uh, the core of your being. And that will probably take some meditation to sensitize it, sensitize yourself to what is it that you actually uh, resonate with. And it might be a different kind of uh, formulation different conceptual framework now moving on you know Robert Bia actually promotes this idea of mastery of the jhanas so like in the retreat you know he talked and you know jhana mastery would be a subset of quilia mastery but it's a i think a very important component where essentially he says um there is an enormous enormous power to intention and the conceptual framework i love that about robert bia because so many meditation teachers are like oh yeah i don't care about the conceptual mind you know bare attention or pure consciousness it's, it's the thing <laughs> or is the non-thing but it's, it's, it's the thing that matters uh the non-thing that matters robert bia is like no guys actually you know psychological processes and uh, kind of a conceptual understanding is absolutely essential so that you can contextualize what you're doing, right? Like that there's a reason why, you know, if you're working on the sixth jhana, like why you're doing it is it's not just because of the sixth jhana. You have to, you have the entire context that puts it in place. And, and that actually gives you a lot of motivation and uh, allows you so many more uh, moves. Actually, and one of the key things that I experienced, you know, even more so than like deepening into a particular frequency, <laughs> a particular mode of vibration or Janic quality, much more so it was integrating the whole conceptual framework of, Quil of Quilia Mastery and Jana Mastery. In particular, um, there is a kind of consciousness that emerges once you've dipped into several of these frequencies that sort of is aware of the reality of all of those frequencies at once. And that has a flavor of its own. And that wouldn't exist. You wouldn't be able to get in touch with it if you didn't have this conceptual framework that was tying together the various states of consciousness. And that might actually be one of the most valuable things. In a sense, like having the consciousness of the possibility of the four formless jhanas and having been in all of them is a gift you know it's precious it's it's something else and it doesn't arise until you've actually kind of contrasted and compared them and and seen all of them at least uh, to some extent and, and that deepens over time as well probably i have a very weak version of that but Already, I noticed there's some profound, profound effects of perception from that. Just kind of like, hey, the ultimate is not just this one or it's not this one, but but actually they paint a picture. They paint a picture and I can savor the feeling of sensing the entire picture and valuing that. So that is a takeaway from this retreat. And I recommend you look into it Um you know, develop this sensibility for kind of this meta jhana. Not meta in the sense of double T, <laughs> but meta in the sense of <laughs> uh, above or beyond or recursively on top of it. You know, something like that. The meta jhana in this case would be kind of uh, the jhana of the awareness of the eight jhanas or something like that. And 
that's a very, very special, very, very valuable, precious state of consciousness. Okay, so another thing, <clears throat> next item <laughs> is, um, well, so I noticed that a lot of what allows you to actually make sense of these states of consciousness is precisely what Robert Biak, well, actually, I think technically it is called this. Uh, so the, nimit, the primary nimitta is the primary thing you're paying attention to. So in the first jhana, the primary nimitta is piti, bodily pleasure. The second jhana, the primary nimitta is sukha, happiness. Um, you know, it, it, it involves, for example, in the seventh jhana, the primary nimitta is like the sense of nothingness and so on. Um, but then there's like secondary nimittas. There's kind of like in the background, there are kind of supportive. I will also explain how that, how that relates to the nonlinear wave computing, uh, and non, sorry, nonlinear optical computing, um, uh, secondary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that, that also makes sense from that framework. I don't know how, if it makes sense in any other framework. So essentially, um, <clears throat> the secondary nimitta, if it is something of the sort of like, Oh, I'm noticing the enjoyment. I'm noticing the peace. So like if you absorb yourself into nothingness, but then in the background, there is this sense of joy around it. Like, wow, this is peaceful. This is different than every other sensation. This is restful. That pleasure functions as a kind of glue that ties it together and leaves a trace. And the metaphor that came to mind as I was doing this and noticing this process over and over again was that it seems like doing these kind of meditation practices kind of like uh, being um, a gigantic ant colony where every moment of experience is actually just like one ant in a particular moment. But the point is that whenever it finds the nectar, you know, whenever it finds like the pot of honey, you know, the seventh jhana or the, you know, the third jhana or whatever it may be, it leaves a trace around it. You know, it's like, oh, not only is that itself very high valence, which is only knowable in the state, but not anywhere else, but also you're leaving a trace around it that tells the organism, hmm, there is positive valence around here. <laughs> and... Uh, that slowly builds this chain of paths of gradients of valence where you now can actually kind of like tie and tether them together and you're forming these like meta structure of how every, you know, highly positive state of consciousness, which is usually very pure and almost memoryless, you know, extreme symmetry, you can't really encode much information there, but in their surroundings, these like slightly more, you know, less pure, but close become also suffused with positive valence that you can remember. And then essentially, as you do this over and over, you know, the space is large and that's why it takes long in this model at the very least. But essentially, you're kind of like an ant that is tracing all of these, all of these paths at many times and gets completely lost. It's somewhere else. It's in Mordor. It's not... <laughs> It's not anywhere a cl a close to a jhana, but, and you know, those paths, the things that actually you learn about them is how to get out of them quickly. You know, that's also part of what you're learning. And especially if you reward yourself for like, okay, wait a second. I've been ruminating for the last 30 minutes without realizing I'm supposed to be meditating. If instead of like, uh, scolding yourself, you, you kind of like feel good about it. That actually, yes, that is giving you that little trace, this positive valence gradient that will accelerate the process of getting out of it next time. So again, kindness and, and love to yourself and, well, consciousness and emptiness and all of that, because uh, you don't want to, um, you don't want, you don't want to get stuck in like patterns of self-judgment that's actually antithetical to the, to the whole project. <laughs> so, so essentially, yeah, it's a similar process, but, but it's much more clear, I think, around the more, you know, pure high valence genic states, you're constructing this set of paths. And so the mind will kind of like have grooves over time as you travel more and more and more times to the nectar, as it were. And I think, yeah, probably an advanced meditator just has like, whoop, 
direct paths from all of the metas and kind of like, you know, Jana mastery is um, essentially, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it forms the, uh, you know, the, the, the sacred shape of, uh, of the Kabbalah or something like that. Um, that would be that would be funny. Um, okay, so that is yeah the kind of like ant search algorithm metaphor that uh, it occurred to me, and maybe that would be an effective way of accelerating the process of meditation with uh, EEG and neurofeedback. If you take that algorithm into account, I'll talk to uh, Steven Surface and <laughs> see what he thinks about this. Uh, he's he's working on something something along those lines. Um, okay, so moving on nothingness why why did i have openings into the realm of nothingness even though i'm not okay so here here is a, an important component robert bia actually mentions in the jana retreat that if you've done a lot of insight practice it's actually quite frequent that the fourth jana will open to you even before the first the second or third jana why because insight meditation deconstructive practices oftentimes give rise to a lot of peacefulness, a lot of equanimity. Now, it is not by its very nature a Janic equanimity, which is kind of insane. Why, why are there so different, different kinds of equanimity, right? But yeah, there's like a kind of equanimity that, you know, in the background maybe is still pretty restless. But there's like a kind of like inner core that is like okay with it. The Janic equanimity is perfectly harmonized. So, so it's, it's a much more narrow state space and much, much better valence. Um, interestingly, even though you're very, very still and you supposedly don't care about pleasure or pain, actually, it's a very high valence state of consciousness. So he recommends that if, you, if you're in that category, you've done, you know, lots of Vipassana retreats or whatever, um, and that is what comes up, then what you can do is kind of like work backwards. Like, yes, First develop the fourth jhana and then see if you can get the third and the second and the first and then move into the formless jhanas or something like that. So he actually is very open to like unorthodox kind of like paths. Um, maybe I'm a bit of a special case here. Why? Because I suffer from hyperphilosophia and I'm not even joking. Like, you know, like when somebody says like, oh, I'm obsessed with football or something or Magic the Gathering or something. And then like, you actually inquire like, okay, in what way are you obsessed? And like, okay, maybe they have like a folder full of like special cards or something. And like, okay, relative to the average person, <laughs> this person obviously is very into magic. But then you, you know, you go to a tournament or something and like you find some of the people who are really into into magic and, and you go to their ho homes and it's like every drawer is full of, you know, common and uncommon and rare cards. And, you know, they actually... <laughs> are making a living out of it. They have posters of all of the magic cards. All of their metaphors are about magic cards. Um, so there's like levels to like how obsessed somebody. So, uh, you know, not bragging, this is actually an impairment in a lot of dimensions of life, but essentially I'm like that, but for, you know, consciousness and philosophy and um, and questions, things such as like, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, so <laughs> um, most people wouldn't believe like, how how uh, how kind of uh, glued I am to to that, <laughs> um, but essentially, you know, I think especially as a, as a child, I spent so long just naturally without ever having heard of meditation, wondering why is there something rather than nothing? Why does anything exist? Why does anything exist? And and not just kind of a shallow wondering, but like listening to music and talking to friends and getting really deep into a strange states of consciousness trying to answer that question however absurd that sounded and however incomprehensible that pursuit seemed to the adults around me or other kids except one friend who actually kind of suffered from the same <laughs> same condition um i think that probably caused uh grooves in my mind uh because naturally i was ac accessing strange states of consciousness around that space when i learned about zero ontology that was very mind altering on its own. I also know from David Pierce, who came up with zero ontology, which is the idea that the information actually has no info. The, the universe has no information and the sum total of all possibilities is equal to in some kind of zero. Might be an answer to why there's something rather than nothing. Uh, he also did that a lot. He also would like get into an altered state by uh, thinking about it. So I think he also has the same condition <laughs> that, I, that I do. Um, 
So when I was kind of like listening about all of the jannas, actually I would naturally gravitated a lot to the seventh jana, which is the the realm of of nothingness. Um, and uh, yeah, it was very synergistic with Piti and very synergistic with Sukha. Um, the way I see it is actually a highly symmetrical state of consciousness, a highly symmetrical configuration of the field of consciousness where there are no internal boundaries. And so there, you can't really say anything about it. And also, if you've seen other videos, and sorry, this is kind of technical, but essentially the Huyen's Fresnel principle applies so that essentially uh, when you do become perfectly symmetrical, every point <clears throat> looks the same. Like the, the shape looks the same from every point. So actually you collapse into just kind of one point with no information. But you're still a shape. I mean, that's like the crazy thing. There's like the difference between the outer shape of consciousness, the inner shape of consciousness. I think the realm of nothingness actually has a specific topology from the outside. We don't know what it is yet, you know, but I'm, I'm sure there is something to it. And um, there is actually a shape around it. But but the formula to, to create that shape that has no internal information is via meditation or something like the realm of nothingness. Um, so an insight that came from this was that actually, if you want to go very deep in that direction, um, you will need to undo a lot of energetic knots that have been constructed throughout your life. Uh, probably would be samskaras in Buddhist lingo or yeah, conditioned existence. I'm not entirely sure. But I think actually at a very literal physical level, a lot of the information content of your experience is in the form of topological knots, internal topological knots. And um, as you, <clears throat> well, here's the thing. Um, if you have like a wave, right? You, you have like a, a particular frequency of sound. Uh, this coherent is just a single sinusoidal at a particular phase. Can you get rid of, of that sound? The answer is yes. You can very much get rid of it by adding the inverse wave to it, right? If you have a more complex sound, um, if it is decomposable as just a sequence of, you know, frequencies that are oscillatory or in incoherent, meaning that like their phase is not changing. Yeah, you can still cancel it out by kind of giving the inverse wave of that. When, you know, the phase of the frequencies are changing over time, it's going to be more difficult, especially if there's no pattern to it. Like if you know in advance what the wave waveform is going to be, then yes, you can always cancel it out. If it's chaotic, noisy, then no, there's going to be a noise residue. And, and at some point, the only thing you can really do to kind of like get rid of a particular noise is to just actually add white noise to kind of smooth it out, make it more regular in the fre frequency space. But um, uh, the, the point that I'm trying to get at is that... Um, when you have simple patterns, it is easier to cancel them out, right? So think of it this way, like in order to access the realm of nothingness, actually you do require a very high level of coherence and concentration so that you actually have a very simple state of consciousness, which then once you learn it, once you learn that simple wave, you can add its inverse wave and flatten it out. Now, that is kind I mean, that is a good metaphor, but it's not entirely the case. I think the reality is a little bit more interesting, actually. Um, let me explain what I mean. Essentially, <laughs> I think these are not just simple waves um, that you need to cancel. What you need to cancel is topological structures. How do you do that? Well, um, you can look up online an anti-vortex versus a vortex. And it turns out that different shapes inherently will have like what's called the winding number of a shape. The Harry Ball theorem, for example, states that <laughs> if you try to combe a sphere, you will always have at the very least one place where one of the hairs is like sticking out. Uh, you know, if the, hair is, if the sphere is full of, full of hairs, it's... Well, it's a vector, it's full of vectors, it's a vector space, and you try to comb it, there's always going to be one vector sticking out. Um, 
but in a torus, that is not the case. You can actually comb a torus. So that actually gives you what's called the winding number, which is how many vortices does a particular space have? Now, uh, the winding number of a particular space in this context would be what is the minimum number that it can have. But then, you know, in another, in another, in another context, you know, if you can actually kind of like uh, modify the field however you want and you're not constrained by initial conditions, yeah, you can make a plane with a lot of vortices. But if you fix the winding number, then if you want to add another vortex, what you will need to add in addition is an anti-vortex. Uh, and you'll see, well, actually the thumbnail of this video hopefully will be one of picture that contrasts cleanly a vortex and an anti-vortex. The point is that, yeah, vortex is kind of like spinning and an anti-vortex is kind of strange. It's like two streams that collide, two streams that collide and they, they, they <laughs> kind of like is going separate ways. That's, it's the opposite of a vortex. And actually, if you put them together, they merge. There's a moment, critical moment when you get a singularity and then they cancel each other out. And then there's no more vortex and no more anti-vortex. Okay, so, you know, the whole topological approach to the boundary problem actually suggests that your consciousness right now is a topological pocket of the fields of physics, which would be a kind of vortex. Now, there's many different kinds of vortex, and you do need a specialized topological mathematical language to talk about all of them. And they have different anti-vortices as well. So I think that when you're accessing, when you're actually meditating on the formless jhanas, a lot of what you're doing, and just to review, you know, the formless jhanas are, you know, the fifth is, the fifth jhana, the first formless jhana is uh, the sphere of infinite space, where you kind of like merge with pure space, you've become space, spacious awareness is all there is. The sixth jhana is infinite consciousness. You're kind of like just very, very aware of, you're aware right now. You're conscious right now. You're, con you're con right now, now, now you're conscious. <laughs> very wide awake, intense, you know, and it happens on LSD more or less commonly in a dirty way, as I'll explain in a second, like not a pure way, but you can get hints of it on LSD for sure. Um, and it's like, wow, wow, like this is happening. But so very, very pure state. Um, the seventh jhana is like nothingness. You're not landing on any construct. And then the primary nimitta of it is the feeling of not landing on any construct. And then the, the eighth jhana is a lot weirder, which is neither perception, not nor perception. And I'm not sure that I've experienced that in any way. Um, uh, maybe, maybe in some states of consciousness, but, um, but uh, not something I can access on jhana practice. Uh, and then the ninth jhana is actually the unfabricated, which is um, might actually be the complete cancellation. So essentially, with the topological approach, what is happening here is that um, essentially something like the realm of nothingness is where you actually just become a torus or something like that. Like you are now kind of like these like smooth fields, so there's no internal content. Maybe even deeper, you know, something like neither perception nor not perception is like, oh, you already cancel it out with another anti-vortex and now it's not a torus, maybe it's a circle. And the idea is that actually the full ninth jhana would be where you find the final anti-vortex that kind of undoes the primary, you know, topological separation that turned you into a pocket of the fields of physics and you actually you just are gone i mean actually what there is is just the fields of physics without any boundaries anymore at least not within that region absolutely trippy way of thinking but very helpful and and i actually noticed uh, once this occurred to me um accessing those states became even more easy because it's almost kind of like the the Jenna practice informed by the anti-vortex model, you're kind of like scanning for 
what kind of sensation will actually undo a particular knot inside you. You're aware of the fact that there are anti-knots. I mean, if you got knotted in the way that you are, clearly there was a sequence of steps that led you to it. There's got to be a way to undo that knot, right? So the question now is, how do you do that in the most efficient way possible? What is the shortest path towards the unmanifested, the absolute? <laughs> and, uh, and I thought that was a very interesting, very helpful uh, uh, insight or like way of seeing this process. This takes me to nothingness as no thingness. It really felt uh, during those uh, experiences that um, a lot of how we actually perceive is, I mean, there's kind of this algorithm, it has to do with Ray Marching and Leharian perception uh, from Stephen Lehar, where essentially there's kind of like this, oh, also like the world sheet from um, uh, hyperbolic geometry of DMT experiences also is related to that. Also manifold learning from um, machine learning. <laughs> All of those are kind of different facets of the same process. Not really, but they're like very related. So essentially, when you look at an object, um, there is kind of, you're reaching out with, with attention and you're kind of like touching it all around. And there's a moment in which like click, it actually becomes a thing. It gets thingified. And that involves some kind of topological closure of these sheets of attention that you're using, you're enveloping. And... Uh, I noticed that when I was close to the realm of nothingness, essentially that would kind of like stop happening. So I would notice kind of this sheet of attention, but it just wouldn't close. Or like that's a move that I was learning to do. It's like to not close it, just let it be. And then it kind of dissipates. And that it, it there is something that it feels like to be that. And I suspect that's actually very related to some kind of emptiness realization. I would have to, that I would have to talk to like several Buddhist teachers to like know exactly how is this related to emptiness realizations. But really, when you're kind of not closing these 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 sheets of attention, and you're hanging out in these open spaces, um, is quite wonderful. I mean, the valence of it is very sublime. And also it triggers a lot of compassion because you don't see people in the normal way, which I think actually we do a lot of closures, actually quite quite a few layers uh, to construct a person. And as we construct the person, we construct their vibe and their the ways in which they might be difficult, the ways in which there might be problems. You know, there's a lot of kind of like things that get built up. When you're not constructing people that way, it's almost kind of like they're half faded. You know, they're kind of like this open open sets and they're not they're not closing and and they feel like part of the universal stream of qualia so all of a sudden you don't really feel them as separate independent self-existing entities with characteristics and essences you feel them as more kind of part of the flow of the universe and it's all one flow so it's very difficult to feel any emotion other than meta towards these unclosed structures and towards yourself as well. It, it happens the same thing. Your future and your, 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 your present self and your past self when you conceptualize it that way. And if you're doing that a lot um, and I plan on practicing it more, um, they, they have this af it has this after effect on perception where also, you know, kind of like after coming out of that state and you look at something, it feels like a thing and not a thing at the same time it's kind of like an in-between and I think that has positive effects uh, you feel less trapped in things in general because you're not thinkifying it's uh, I'm sure th that there's like some loss of some subtle high valence characteristics that do come with a closure uh, so I'm sure this is not a panacea or like just a plain better state or something like that but I suspect it would cause just so much relief in a lot of contexts. So, yeah, something something to ponder. All right, so the last two things I'll mention um, is comparison to psychedelics uh, and drugs and uh, how this relates to nonlinear optical computing uh, as a paradigm for making sense of states of consciousness, uh, 
Quilly computing more broadly. So comparisons with psychedelics. First, uh, something like 2CB. 2CB might give you a really good hint of PT um, and he hedonic tone. Um, kind of a, um, yeah, like a, like strong vibratory electric strobing uh, PT happens on, on something like 2CB. Um, I wonder, I mean, I don't, I don't know of anybody who's done the experiment, but like, yeah, I wonder if like 2CB might accelerate a little bit the development of PT. So probably towards the beginning of like a January retreat, maybe, except that 2CB does have a bit of a come down and an after effect. So I'm not sure if it would be that good of an idea, but might be, especially if somebody just does not experience PT at all. Somebody's like very anhedonic. I, I wonder if 2CB might help. Um, THC, I think, is related to the jhanas very tangentially. Um, it's kind of very dissociating for a lot of people. Um, it's very conceptual for a lot of people, especially it causes a lot of like feedback in kind of the working memory slots. And so mm, I'm not really sure that it's very compatible with the jhanas, except that also, if you're the kind of person who experiences a pleasant body high from it, maybe it might help kickstart PD, especially at very tiny doses. Um, so I'm not, I'm pretty ambivalent about its utility. LSD and psilocybin. Um, I know, I believe there was one study, but I, I do know a, a couple people who've taken psilocybin at the end of like long retreats and they said it was really synergistic with the, the meditative state would be really interesting to interview them or ask them to write a, a tree report about it. To me, it makes sense that it would, it would be synergistic because both LSD and psilocybin are fairly clean energizers of frequencies. Currently, my current estimate is between 15 and 20 hertz, uh, stroboscopic and replay uh, effects, um, which you can read more about in modeling, modeling psychedelic tracers with QRI's uh, tracer tool or something like that. Uh, yeah, I mean, essentially you can measure these things kind of like how many strobes per second you're getting on LSD. That also happens at, in the body sense. Um, it all, you know, you get kind of these like intensified feedback effect and annealing effects. And I think at the peak of an L good LSD state or maybe LSD plus like Fenibit or something like that, something that like smooths out the vibrations, probably there's a very big like good opening for cultivating like strong PT, strong uh, Suka, but uh, it's very chaotic. So I suspect also it would be mostly helpful for people fairly early on as a way of kind of like jittering away of their current attractor state. Uh, one note here is that high dose LSD, which I don't really recommend, well, don't recommend psychedelics in general. They're, they can really be very, very unpleasant. Um, but... It is actually very common for, you know, advanced meditators to say that LSD or psilocybin gave them a mystical experience that is what led them to take seriously something like Buddhism or, or taking seriously meditation or yoga. And uh, I can see that uh, essentially on high doses of LSD, sometimes you do experience things that are, I suspect, essentially like a really high energy version of the sixth jhana. Uh, kind of like becoming universal consciousness, rainbow consciousness. Sometimes you experience kind of these like huge source of consciousness that is full of rainbows around it. And as you become it, it feels like you're one with everything. And then you're oh, the ultimate consciousness, super consciousness. That territory, I think it's extremely related to Janus. Um, the problem is it's very chaotic and there's like very negative versions of it and so like i don't or, you know i don't know how to uh i don't know how to induce them reliably or anything but if you're somebody who responds really well to lsd i suspect probably it would synergize with a jana retreat i don't know when it would be best to time it uh at the beginning at the end at the middle i don't know we would have to do a lot of research hopefully in the future you know obviously ethical legal and and all that but it seems promising to me um, DMT, 
Oh, I'll, I'll mention that, yeah, with these psychedelics, um, they would all still be like dirty jhanas because a part of your consciousness, let's say, may like center on the sixth jhana, but then there's like a lot of other chaotic stuff and decorations that are <laughs> ongoing, whereas they may actually be really difficult to get rid of. The annealing process oftentimes doesn't get rid of all of them. Maybe with the right combination of drugs, I don't know. Um, but uh, in general, these would be more glimpses than like the real deal, as it were. Uh, DMT, higher frequency, uh, estimated at like 30 hertz, um, fairly neutral. So that's good, good energy, uh, energization. But lots of lateral inhibition. I mean, the, the problem with DMT is that all of the patterns that you see tend to be very wavy. And it's very difficult to actually experience like very smooth space. Uh, allegedly you can, but it takes a lot of practice. So I'm not sure like it's really a direct path in any way. Um, as a consequence, um, yes, you can experience facets of the first four jhanas uh, on DMT, but they're kind of like embedded in a matrix of a lot of other things. So, for example, I've heard a long-term meditator say that before achieving the jhanas, on a DMT breakthrough experience, what they experienced was uh, an alien coming out of a spaceship. And the alien had uh, all kinds of crazy energies, but that wasn't the point. The point was that the energy of the space of the spaceship, the inside of the spaceship, was filled with what he later realized was third jhana consciousness. Um, I mean, I suspect this fabrication of your mind, you know, we can play with the idea of <laughs> these are entities from another dimension and their spaceship is inherently always filled up with third jhana peacefulness. Maybe that would be really cool. It would be really cool if that is a consciousness technology you can create. I don't know. <laughs> um, but the point is that, yeah, I mean, like on DMT, if you do experience jhanic factors, they will be kind of like embedded within a context that has a lot of other things. So I, I'm very skeptical that like you can use DMT specifically to accelerate, you know, the jhana practice. I'm sure there's a lot of things for which DMT is very useful, though. Uh, I mean, especially for understanding consciousness and its computational role, all of that. You know, there's a lot more that I will say about that in the future. Uh, ketamine. Ketamine is relevant in so far as it does tend to produce these unnodding process. And I think high doses of ketamine are wild and can actually lead to something akin to the formless jhanas. Oftentimes there will be like dirty mixtures of formless jhanas, let's say like a lot of spaciousness and a little bit of nothingness or like a blob of kind of like slowed down spatiotemporal qualia <laughs> that feels like a blob of like negentropy. Okay, maybe that is kind of like a mixture of the fifth and the seventh jhana. So this, they're going to be like weird mixtures. The other problem, though, is that it's, they're off-key. And they're off-key because, well, at least according to QRI's models, what dissociatives are doing, is they're actually slowing down the speed of wave propagation in the, in the nervous system. And so as a consequence, you actually get a kind of this desynchronization from the predictive coding hierarchies that lead to um, essentially the resonant modes of that nervous system, which is the ketamine-infused nervous system, which are different resonant modes than your normal everyday nervous system. And as a consequence, I think they can be helpful, you know, something like ketamine, a, a profound ketamine experience, a K-hole, so to speak. I don't like that term, it trivializes it. Ketamine can be really profound. Um, it can give you a glimpse of the quality of it, but you probably should know that the precise vibratory frequency of the jhanas of your natural state of consciousness will be different than the vibratory frequencies of the pseudo jhanas on ketamine. And, uh, and I think that is what makes them kind of limiting, like you're not going to be able to entrain them really. But there, there is this unnodding process. And I think like, yeah, I mean, ketamine therapy, occasional use, uh, relatively high dose in a proper setting can be, I think, like, yeah, very therapeutic for people to essentially move on, move on from things in life because they can undo a lot of knots, kind of the psychic surgery. And they're like in a 
state of consciousness with a much lower winding number. If you remember <laughs> what I was telling you about the winding number of your state of consciousness is how many vortices, how many topological knots it has. So a post-ketamine state of consciousness might be one with a much lower winding number, which in general, in general, is going to feel better. Not always. Again, there might be some loss of positive valence if they were finally finally calibrated and they were consonant with each other. But if you're pursuing ketamine therapy, presumably that's not the case. Finally, 5-MeO-DMT. Now we are talking. So 5-MeO-DMT probably is actually something that gives rise to fairly clean formless janus states of consciousness. Again, I suspect it does slightly change the speed of wave propagation. So again, they're, they're not perfectly, they're not exactly the natural janus that you would actually experience, but they're probably very close, very close. And, uh, you know, don't listen to me. There's like, listen to Shenzhen Young. I mean, Shenzhen Young, you know, He's like an 80-year-old master, Zen master, who is recognized by the community and, you know, other Zen masters as, yeah, fully awakened and, you know, like all the way there. And he says that of all the substances that he's tried, and he's tried a bunch of substances, especially back in the day, but, you know, more recently he tried 5-MeO-DMT. 5-MeO-DMT actually does give you the same the same kind of ego death and, you know, communion with the unfabricated, you know, the absolute as something like a hardcore 100 day tantric um, practice of extreme ascetism, which he, uh, you know, experienced in the past. And like, uh, it's very grueling. It takes a lot of effort. It's very difficult and very unpleasant in the way there. And actually, he's very hopeful that, yeah, with five, if you have a 5-MeO-DMT vape pen or a series of vape pens with different concentrations, you can have that ego death in your bedroom, you know, <laughs> whenever you want. Again, this, this is a very, very strong experience, and I don't, you know, don't take it lightly. It's like giving birth. It's a very serious thing, very serious thing that you're doing to yourself. Don't take it lightly. This is not going to the bar. This is not, not even going to friends. Uh, you know, this is a profound thing, profound thing. You don't take it lightly. So, but the, the problem though, is that it's very shocking to the organism, especially if you didn't do it slowly and uh, didn't adjust over time. I mean, if I recommend, you know, like the, the sort of protocol I would recommend for 5-MeO-DMT, which again, is there, I'm not really recommending it. It's kind of like what I would suggest for a research project on this area would be slowly uh, attuning yourself to it over the course of like, at least, you know, like a week or something like that. Like one day you do like one milligram. Maybe you do it twice that day. That's it. <laughs> you learn what one milligram is like. And then another day you do two milligrams and then another day three milligrams. Like you slowly climb up until you get to something like 10 or 15 milligrams, which is when you start having these full, full breakthrough ego death experiences, full merging with infinite consciousness experiences or pure nothingness or the absolute, all of that. You've got to be really careful. And my current understanding is that because if you just jump right in first, you will panic. The ego will panic. The ego it really hurts like it is like oh my gosh all these projects all these attachments i have in life that is the very substance of my existence are revealed to be a dream of infinite consciousness like there's there's a feeling of profound triviality uh which again i actually i think it's kind of illusory i actually think this lifetime is very significant and not i don't buy into that kind of dualism but in the moment it's prof that's but it profoundly feels like it's shocking. You may panic, you may rebel against it, and you may struggle all the way. So not only are you going to die, your ego is going to die, you're going to suffer all the way through. <laughs> and then on top of that, uh, you're not even going to be able to remember it properly because you haven't created the network of positive valence tethers to it. So yeah, I mean, what all of the meditators I know who can access the formless janus say is... They're delightful, but they're an acquired taste. And they, 
absolutely realize that if somebody were to just access them out of the blue, it would be a profoundly confusing and disorienting and generally pretty unpleasant experience after the fact. So that is why, I mean, I am very, very hopeful for 5MEO DMT as an aid in meditation, let's say in a long meditation retreat and you titrate and like, hey, maybe we can cut how much meditation you need in order to access the formless jhanas by a lot, you know, maybe like by 80%, 90%, but it has to be done properly. You know, this is not, <laughs> it's, it's not, a, it's not child's, child's play here. This is serious. This is very serious stuff. Okay, and the, yeah, the final thing is, um, <laughs> maybe I'll throw in in there that uh, something like alcohol, I would say actually is fairly anti-genic. The only way in which alcohol might be kind of genic is in the sense of in very low doses, like less than one drink, uh, kind of activates a little bit of pity. So I did do the experiment of having like... <clears throat> It must have been like a tenth of a glass of wine, like <laughs> a tenth of a Pinot Noir glass of wine. And because of like the highly sensitized state of consciousness I was in, in the middle of the retreat, I clearly noticed it. And I noticed that the focus wasn't great. Like it actually diminished sensory clarity, even that amount diminished sensory clarity. But it did provide a little bit of pity in the body that wasn't there. And then I could meditate on that. The, was it net positive or negative? Unclear. Uh, was good information. But uh, it was pretty obvious that taking more would actually just take me out of the state. It's counterproductive. So um, probably, probably not not the way to go. <laughs> not a good synerg not very synergistic with uh, with the practice. Um, finally, yeah, nonlinear. Optical computing, just a couple of reflections. I think a lot of what you can experience on these kind of retreats makes no sense with current neuroscience paradigms. I mean, like predictive coding a little bit, you know, connecting specific harmonic waves a little bit. But, and the same thing with psychedelics. I mean, especially something like high dose DMT is like, like, I mean, if you can experience four dimensional objects, hyperbolic geometry, that throws out the window all of these notions that, you know, ha hallucinogens, all they do is like activate the resonant modes of the visual system, which is obviously not only what they're doing, because that would only lead to Euclidean shapes, you know, the hard coded predictive coding composition, like, no, no, that's not what happens. You can actually get these absolutely insane contraptions, <laughs> multidimensional, you know, we're at QRI, we're, we're working on actually, you know, formalizing this and, and proving that this is the case. You know, we should actually investigate this very carefully. The point I'm, I'm making is that um, if you actually care about reality, if you if you take consciousness seriously, um, yeah, you will have to go th beyond current neuroscience paradigms, beyond current philosophy of mind and look at the thing and try to make sense of what is going on. And the only framework that I have that can actually make sense of all of this is this idea that the brain is an optical, nonlinear optical computer. And consciousness <laughs> is, well, there's probably more to this. This is probably just the scratching the surface, but consciousness is probably an eigenmode of the electromagnetic field in the brain that creates a topological pocket where essentially it's mathematically equivalent to the photons moving inside it, creating a standing wave pattern. Um, and because of the nonlinear optical properties, when the energy levels reach a certain threshold, the waves stop actually going through each other and they start bouncing off each other. And so on DMT, for example, uh, in low doses, you know, you get these two dimensional resonant modes, like a wall becoming tessellated. In higher doses, you get three dimensional resonant modes. Again, much higher energy, um, <clears throat> gets to the nonlinearities so that the waves are actually bouncing off each other. And then there's this whole process of energy dissipation. And so the symmetrical shapes are energy sinks. I've covered all of that extensively <laughs> throughout, throughout my career at QRI <laughs> um, for the last however many years. Um, 
and higher doses, here is where like it actually challenges neuroscientific paradigms. You start experiencing hyperbolic structures with the pro a proper hyperbolic metric or higher dimensional structures. These make sense from the point of view of coupled oscillators of a nonlinear optical system um, that are generating implicit higher dimensions. I don't think I don't know how it could make sense otherwise. Um, the point being that I think that in this model, essentially, attention is where the waves are concentrating and awareness essentially is where they bounce off of. Whenever you find when a place in your consciousness to which you're attending, there is a corresponding oscillatory complement, which would be the field of awareness that is paying attention to it. So when you're getting to very concentrated states of consciousness, kind of what is happening is that there is a nonlinear bundle at the center. It could be spread out, but there's many configurations, but the center would be an example, such that the periphery is bouncing off the center and you get to that like stable eigen mode. Um, but essentially, you can do it so that when it arises, it arrives at the center is either in focus or out of focus, or it can be in phase or out of phase, or you can have a more diffuse structure where, for example, um, this is very weird, but it, I mean, essentially, yeah, think of kind of like adding lasers in a quartz um, where the waves start to actually bounce off each other. Um, there are status of consciousness where the distinction between awareness and attention is not quite clear. Um, and on top of that, I mean, this is where it gets like really bizarre, but I think it's consistent with physics, is that essentially the entirety of the experience is what it feels like to be every point in that experience and the information that every point in that experience have access to at the same time, like in superposition. Very weird. I know, very, very weird. This is the only way I can explain the jhanas. This is the only way I can explain like high dose LSD. Um, it's going to take years to actually formalize this properly, but I'm, yeah, I think this is the right, right direction. Essentially, the jan formless jhanic states of consciousness are such states of consciousness where the field is homogeneous, so it's symmetrical. Essentially, every point looks the same. Uh, the entire field looks the same from every point. And then the topology of the field determines whether the lines concentrate at a point, which might, for example, um, mean the sixth jhana, the realm of infinite consciousness. Essentially, the entire field is self-observing itself. It con concentrates in what point, and that point essentially gathers information of the entire field. Or, for example, in the formless jhana of nothingness, Essentially, that is a place where the lines never concentrate. Actually, they're completely parallel. And so there's no focal point. So it's kind of like a series of lenses that are moving light around in such a way that it never focuses, which it would be a, a possible, you know, a possible state of, a state of a, a nonlinear optical system. Um, and then, you know, something like the unmanifested, <laughs> the ninth jhana, would be where actually the field is completely quiet. You know, it's actually can it has canceled out all of its oscillations. And plus, you know, it's topologically open, so something like that. Now, the brain is also, you know, also has a predictive coding neural mesh and uh, which has its own, you know, hierarchical structure. But the whole idea here is that the field is actually uh, around all of that neural network. And actually, you know, the, the consciousness that you're having right now is the result of how the neural network has learned to tune different properties of the field. And so what you're doing when you're meditating is in a sense, you're changing the neural weights and seeing how that affects the shape of the field. And over time, you're learning to control the field in new ways, such that you can access such as, for example, the fully unfocused state or the fully focused state. Um, 
And I think that that has a lot of explanatory power. I will also add that um, the brain is a little bit more complicated as well because you have the amygdala, you have the prefrontal cortex, you have you know cerebellum, <laughs> you have a, a, you know and the homunculi. But the the main point here is that um, the amygdala may kind of like provide the kind of like style sheet for the entire uh, field. It's adding kind of like the fine level. Um, consonance, dissonance, especially dissonance and noise, uh, vibratory components, is sort of kind of like, you know, in an um, old TV, quote unquote, old TV, um, where there's like essentially like a ray of electrons uh, that is being like moved around in this, uh, you know, like scatter, I think, it's, oh, raster plot, right? And he's like painting a picture. Well, there's like a little uh, component inside it that is with magnets controlling where the beam moves. So I think of the amygdala as something like that. It's kind of like controlling the quality of attention. So attention wants to move here. If you're in a very anxious, you know, very um, uh, angsty state of consciousness, the amygdala will function as kind of like something that vibrates in a slightly chaotic way. So whatever you pay attention to will be slightly modified in a non you know, kind of like unpleasant, low valence way. And slowly you're going to entrain that pattern on the HTML of experience, on the sensory doors, as it were. Um, you know, what you're doing with the Janus as well is like learning to control that so that the quality of attention is always like very soft or symmetrical, homogeneous, regular. Um, and on top of that, you also have the pleasure centers, which I think and this comes from uh, Mike Johnson in Principia Qualia, where he suggested that the pleasure centers essentially are um, something that is kind of allowing the whole brain to enter into resonance. So it's kind of like a shortcut that and allow, allows large-scale synchronization. So there's a lot of components here. You know, it's, it's a complicated system. But overall, though, I think that to explain these odd states of consciousness where, yes, there's kind of this global binding, you're simultaneously aware of all of these different components, but then also you're paying attention to only some of them. And then the shape of attention can be modified. And then if you add the attention to itself in a certain way, you convolve it on top of itself. Sometimes it disappears. If you kind of like add an inverse version of your consciousness, you become nothingness. Like all of these different strange effects to me, only makes sense in light of something like a nonlinear optical paradigm, uh, which is, yeah, why I put a lot of stock in it. Um, and I think, yeah, that's uh, that's about it. Oh, yeah, the, I guess like the last thing of, of that paradigm is too, from the previous retreat that I, it, it became pretty clear to me that we actually have something like seven attention heads. Uh, the way in which you access, for example, the first jhana is by synchronizing enough the sensory doors that they acquire the proper vibe. This would be the PT essentially has a vibratory quality such that wherever the attention heads um, settle, they will be vibrating exactly the same way. And when they're vibrating the same way, the attention heads actually collapse into just one. And as a consequence, that gives rise to a kagata, which is <laughs> um, kind of like single pointed attention is not actually single point because it could be like spread out spatially. But the idea is kind of like there's one prominent thing. And I think that's why there's a threshold effect. You know, you do require kind of like a threshold of pity in order to cohere all of a sudden into the first jhana. And I think that, you know, that's that's kind of like what's happening. The very simple metaphor here is if you have 10 pendulum clocks on a wall, and they start desynchronized, over time, they're going to share little vibrations uh, through the wall, and they will all, excuse me, get in sync. If you have 10,000 clocks on a wall, they will never synchronize. Uh, essentially, their natural state is, um, you know, sometimes you will get like pockets of synchrony or like traveling waves of synchrony, but they never synchronize all at once. Now, if you start adding connections between them, there's going to be two phase transitions. In the first phase transition, you will get competing clusters of coherence. And I think that's kind of like something that happens on DMT. You get your brain more interconnected than normal, but not enough to make it fully coherent. So you get competing clusters. Every clock belongs to one cluster, but there is not one cluster that 
contains all of them. But then if you add even more connections, there's another phase transition where the whole system now coheres into one big, uh, big synchrony, uh, which I think is what's happening on 5MEO DMT, but also it's happening on the Janus. Essentially, I think what is going on here is that the natural network topology of, let's say, the prefrontal cortex is such that it's, um, you know, a tractor state is competing clusters of coherence. And once you synchronize enough the sensory doors, the HTML of experience uh, and the amygdala is quieted down or is very steady, then the attention heads can pivot off of the sensory doors, the coherence in the sensory doors, to then have an effective higher degree of interconnectivity functionally and as a consequence synchronize and then you get like this whole synchronization of the sensory doors and the attention heads and that i think is the janic janic state of consciousness <laughs> all right so i know this is a lot hopefully it will be helpful if it's not helpful to you now i'm sure well it's just, hopefully it will be helpful to you in the future if you do these practices you want to collaborate with QRI or learn more. Uh, and that's it. I'll keep you updated if I do another retreat. Uh, just very happy to share. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Infinite please. And see you another time to talk about another topic. Ciao.